So there's bad news and there's good news. The bad news is, in the UK at least, we're back in lockdown again. Which means after a summer of running with precautions, Heritage Railways everywhere have been forced to close again and those who haven't already had to cancel their Santa specials this year are waiting to see if they can run them or not. If you want to see your favourite Heritage Railway through a very difficult winter, please do spare what you can for whichever appeal you wish to give to. From the East Lanks and the Great Central, to Amerton Farm and the Wells and Walsingham, they all still need your support. As for the rest of us, I guess it remains a matter of staying safe, being careful, and looking after each other as much as we can. And to all of those key workers, including those in the rail industry who continue to put their lives on the front line just so we can keep working through this rotten mess, thanks for being you, but don't be afraid to look after yourselves as well. And to anybody who may not be able to see each other this Christmas, rest assured that you're not alone here. Take it easy. But the good news is, thanks to permission granted by former status quo drummer John Coglin and his backing band, we now have a new, temporary theme song for this show. If people like it, and enough people buy the full single linked in the description, then who knows, we might be allowed to keep it. But while we're in lockdown, let's keep our heads down. <laughs> In accordance with 2020 being an absolute bastard, the end of October saw the death of legendary actor Sean Connery. In memory of his passing, maybe it's not such a bad idea to review one of the other films that people remember him for, and not necessarily one of his bad ones. The first Great Train Robbery, written by Michael Crichton in 1975, was adapted for film three years later. Based around the Great Gold Heist of 1855, it's one of those films that almost seems to live in a world of its own, where you're not sure if it's a comedy, a drama, a thriller, or a historical account, but you can't help but just wait and see what it brings up next. What's the film about? Spoiler alert, you've been warned. In 1855, the Crimean War is being financed by gold bullion that's regularly shipped from Britain to the front line. Part of its journey is along the southeastern main line from London to Folkestone. The value of this gold is the modern equivalent of over 2.7 million pounds. As such, it attracts the interest of gentleman thieves Edward Pierce, played by Connery, and Robert Agar, played by Donald Sutherland. The whole film sees them, along with Pierce's long-suffering girlfriend, played by Leslie Ann Down, plan and attempt the most daring crime of their time. Will there be a robbery from a moving railway train? Or will they fail like all other attempts gone before? And what was Pierce's motivation for the whole caper? The acting from our main leads is more or less as you'd expect. Connery plays the smooth-talking Scotsman, and Sutherland is hardly that good at hiding his accent either. Though interestingly, the actors did perform many of their own stunts. Ballet dancer Wayne Sleep had to climb a 60-foot wall and traverse rotisserie spikes in his character's attempts at a prison break. Upon filming the sequence, Sleep famously said to Crichton, I'm an actor, not a stuntman. But because there were no stuntmen who were short enough to stand in for him, Sleep had to do the scene anyway and without much by way of safety equipment from the looks of it. And of course, Connery had to traverse a moving train twice while it was travelling much faster than the director told him it was going to run. With no form of safety equipment or green screen cop-outs being used, this film must be an insurance nightmare by today's standards. That being said, Connery and Sutherland may get top billing, and Connery may have risked life and limb, but the real stars of the show must be the production crew. Most notably, Oscar-winning cinematographer Jeffrey Unsworth and Oscar-winning editor David Bretherton, who managed to make this film look and feel like it was released in a much earlier time period. There's a unique blend of handheld shots in dramatic moments mixed with traditional mechanical camera movements used throughout. A number of scenes resemble much older British films, where the actors exchange dialogue and move around with as few edits and alternative angles as possible. Take, for instance, this scene where two heads of police are discussing extra precautions on the train. It's all done with one continuous shot lasting 116 seconds. 1917 was an impressive technological achievement in fooling the audience over as few cuts as possible, but once upon a time there really were fewer margins for error and all the actors, extras and camera crews had to get more things right in one take. Early films and TV shows seem to be performed in much the same way as theatre, just having cameras pointed at the scene instead of audiences. Now this form of shooting and editing was going out of fashion by the late 1970s, which perhaps gives this film a more timeless feel than something like Richard Donner's Superman or the early Jaws movies. That being said, the action scenes like robberies and chases had an interesting mix of quick-cutting handheld shots too. 
Overall, it's a nice blend of ordinary and extraordinary filming and editing. Oh yeah, don't forget the trains. To the film's visual advantage, the location shooting was mostly undertaken in the Republic of Ireland, with Dublin's Houston station dressing up as London Bridge. Albeit, there didn't seem to be much dressing required, as the station had barely been altered since it was built in 1846. The train scenes took place on the stretch of line between Mullingar and Athlone in County Westmeath, which is now yet another cycleway. Oh well, still better than a dual carriageway. The locomotives were the two J15060s numbers 184 and 186, not to be confused with the Great Eastern variant, built for the Great Southern and Western Railway in 1879 and 1880, with 184 heavily redecorated with dummy outside frames, no cab and a brass dome for the film. If you squint hard enough, it may look something like the sort of thing James Lance and Cudworth might have been designing in the 1850s, but with very few photographs of that era, perhaps it's better just to let your imagination run with it. The same could be said for the coaching stock. In a similar practice to vintage four-wheel coach restoration of today, the consist bodies were made on a load of old wagon chassis. It's heavily doubtful that Liverpool and Manchester-style stagecoaches of the 1830s would have found their way this far south after more than 20 years of railway development, but again, imagination, run with it, etc. It is, however, so refreshing to see this being done with real trains instead of prop ones. If this film were made today, chances are the London Bridge station set would be made of a handful of studio-built elements against an endless amount of green screen and CGI that would date itself within a decade and those studio-built elements would likely struggle to find a new use after their screen time. Here though, because everything is real, done for real, and already feels more old-fashioned, the film has fared much better for its age than some of its contemporaries. It's just a shame, really, that, according to the Railway Preservation Society of Ireland, there are no plans to return number 184 to steam, due to her poor condition and the lack of demand for such an old, saturated engine with limited power and fuel capacity. Now, if you're a die-hard historian who's looking for a full account of what happened in 1855, or if you're easily triggered by things which are out of place, then rather predictably, this film isn't for you. I'll try not to go full history buffs on you because it's not my place to steal Nick Hodges' thunder, but we can't exactly look at this film without highlighting the many historical inaccuracies within. Things like modern railway signalling and modern full metal girder bridges and concrete platforms, the whole rooftop heist thing that didn't happen, the police using whistles when they actually used rattles until the 1870s, the extras in the hanging scene that are dressed in 1970s denim and leathers, the aftermath of the robbery being rushed when it was actually stretched out over more than a year. I mean, what's next? Electric lighting and battery torches in the 1850s? Oh, no, never mind. Unfortunately, there was one part of the film that seemed a little too plausible for its own good. In the first third, there's a scene where Connery's character attends a ratting tournament, now, to those who aren't aware of it, ratting was a sport in a similar way to cockfighting, where animals would fight against each other and bets were placed on which animal would win. There were fears of the RSPCA getting involved at the sight of cruelty to animals in this scene, so in some versions, the more graphic shots of rats being attacked by dogs had to be cut. But because the scene was so integral to the setup of one of the characters, it couldn't be taken out altogether. But there is at least one historical change in the film's favour. For decades, people have dismissed the rooftop train heist as implausible, thinking that, in the days before continuous brakes, brakemen were positioned on the rooftops along the train. Now, in the very early days of passenger railways, this was the case. But according to railway historian Anthony Leslie Dawson, rooftop brakemen had gone out of fashion by the 1850s in favour of mechanical brake vans at both ends of the train. So even though the robbery scene takes a lot of artistic licence with the real robbery, it's not entirely implausible and makes for a terrific set piece. And then there's the music. It was hardly the most anticipated film of 1978 with the biggest budget, but that didn't stop Jerry Goldsmith from treating it to an incredible score. Some have argued the music is a bit over the top, and I honestly could retire on the money I could have made from listening to people saying, music ruins railway films. But much like Georges Auric's score for the Titfield Thunderbolt, the music adds a sense of grandeur and adventure that carries you from scene to scene in anticipation of what's going to happen next. Music ruins railway films, my ass. 
While perhaps taking a few liberties with artistic license and historical accuracy, the first great train robbery is an intriguing piece of work. With such elaborate production values, two inimitable leads, and a unique interpretation of mid-Victorian railways and lifestyle, it seems to emulate Buster Keaton's The General in some ways. It feels so charismatic in its approach to the events and the time period that it helps you overlook the anachronisms and changes and just takes you along for the ride. It's a very slow build-up to the robbery itself, but if you're a fan of stylistic period dramas, crime capers, steam trains, and Sean Connery, then it's at least worth a try. I'm Chris, and I'm here to gauge the issue. I lost my mind in lockdown Time and time again I lost my mind